Thanks for staying back. And I know it's hard to stay back this late on Friday evening. Um, so and I was wondering whether it's, is it bad to give a talk, late talk on Friday evening or first talk on Saturday morning? I don't know. So <laughs> we'll see. We'll go tomorrow's morning attendance. Um, so, so this is joint work with Mark Rudelson and Adam Smith. Um, this will cover a couple of papers that we had on this topic. Um, so let's start by describing uh, the standard setting in database privacy. So we have a database D, and we want to release some function f on this database privately. The, the question uh, that we're going to ask in this, I mean, answer, try to answer in this talk is, how much distortion is needed to release f of D to guarantee the privacy of D centuries? And the, the, we have seen in this workshop so far that we have made huge progress in this, both upper and lower bounds on, uh, on, really, on this understanding this problem. And in this paper, we are, in this talk, we're going to try to understand it from a slightly different perspective. So we are not going to restrict ourselves to differential privacy, but we are going to ask this under a very loose notion of privacy. Okay. And the way we are going to say something is non-private is by understanding uh, a, a reconstruction attack. So what's a reconstruction attack? So let's say that we want uh, some function f to be evaluated on this database. And there's a private algorithm that sits and says that it releases f of d plus some noise. So we'll say a reconstruction attacks uh, for an adversary would succeed if, he, if the adversary can construct a d hat, which is a good approximation of d. Okay. Um, the reason is that since if you, if you can make, if you can reconstruct almost all of the database, then it should be obvious that it, it doesn't, it's not a good notion of privacy under any, any notion of privacy. So, it's, so a recursion, uh, recursion attack implies a lower bound for any reasonable notion of privacy. It's, so, it's, so these low bounds are much stronger than just for differential privacy. Uh, so this is going to be the talk summary. So I'm going to show that you can uh, use linear reconstruction techniques um, in surprisingly many settings. I mean, I mean, I think most of these things was even surprising to us because many of the functions that we are going to analyze are, don't even look l linear in any way. So some like logistic regression or M estimators. But surprisingly, you can use a simple technique called linear reconstruction that would work for all these problems. Um, so the attack would work under for all these problems, but the analysis of these attacks would be done under some distributional assumption of the data. So we are going to assume the data is some IID to analyze, uh, to get the lower bounds. Okay, so, so one of the themes that have been established over the last decade, ever since uh, the seminal paper of Dinura and Nisim, is that privacy requires distortion. Okay, um, in fact, it's, I mean, uh, Dinura and Nisim showed that if you answer too many uh, queries uh, too accurately, I mean, they use subset some queries, then uh, there is an adversary who can reconstruct the database almost entirely. And so this is fairly well understood now. Um, so just for concrete, as I let me just talk about a couple of slides about denunism attack to set the ground. Um, so here's the setting in, that was analyzed in Dinura Nisim and also in many of the follow-up papers. So we have n users, and each user is supposed to have a secret bit, which is 0, 1. And then we have, a, we need to, uh, we have, say, let's say we want to release in a product query with this x. So we have some vector s, and we want to compute this in a product of s with x. Okay. Um, so let's say there is a private algorithm that's, that computes these uh, inner products and r releases f of x plus some noise. Uh, and let's say that we don't release one such query, but we re release for m such queries. So, so we, we have s1, s2 to sm, and for each of these uh, vectors, we release uh, this f of sx plus noise. Okay. And, and the, the goal of that adversary is that given these m releases, is to construct an x hat, which is a good approximation of x. Um, so, Dinura and Nisim showed that uh, informally that, I mean, this is the informal statement that if, uh, if m is order of n, uh, so if you have n, n such releases, and each release has at most order of square root of n noise, so the amount of noise that you add for each answer is order of little of square root of n, sorry, uh, then there is an adversary who can reconstruct almost the uh, entire database. Uh, so you can construct one minus little front fraction of the database. Yeah. So that, that's very well understood. And there have been actually tremendous work in this area following the, that paper. So the questions have been asked about what is a good set of, uh, what, are the, what are the different subsets, what are the good different 
ways of say, creating these sets as. Uh, there have been papers on understanding the number of queries, the trade-off between the number of queries, and the running time of the algorithms, and so on. Uh, so in a product queries are nice, but they are not very natural. So, uh, so what we have been trying to do is to understand linear reconstruction attacks to obtain privacy bounds for natural and symmetric queries. So in a couple of papers, we have shown that many, uh, I mean, natural functions could be could are, could be analyzed using linear reconstruction attacks. So we have looked at uh, marginal contingency tables, and also recently we looked at uh, some regression analysis, boolean functions, releasing boolean functions, and so on. So that's going to be the the talk that I'm going to co cover now. Um, so let's under, uh, so what's a linear reconstruction problem? So it's a fairly very well understood and fairly simple problem. So given a vector z. Uh, which is some ax plus e, where a is some real, real matrix, and e is some unknown noise vector. The question is, can you construct as x hat, which is a good approximation of x? So, so z is uh, so x is some secret vector, a is some real value matrix, e is some unknown noise vector, and given z, you want to construct x hat, which is a good approximation of x. Uh, this problem is actually comes in a, almost like in, machine, in a lot of pro, in lots of area like machine learning, image, and so on. And the natural approach for solving this is uh, look at some LP normalization of this. So you take a z minus ax, put some p norm, the standardly the standard you put p equal to two or one. And when you have p equal to two, you, this is known as least squared method. And p equal to one, it uh, becomes a linear program, so it's called LP decoding. Uh, just uh, one slide about least squares uh, attack. So so if you want to say minimize this problem. Um, if uh, one of the, the simplest way would be to take a single value decomposition of this matrix A, um, that's U sigma V transpose, and then define a pseudo inverse of A, and then define X hat as A inverse Z rounded to close to zero or one. So I was assuming the data is Boolean, so you just round the, take A inverse Z and then just round them, either if it's greater than half, pick it one, less than half, make it zero. And this, if uh, and this attack would work actually, I mean this is this least square attack would work actually, and this is the standard way of way how Dinur and Nisim analyze their attack also and following works. Uh, the 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 thing that needs uh, that's needed on A to make this attack work is that the least singular value of A is sufficiently high. Um, so I think it's uh, so what you need is that the a is an M cross N matrix. What you need is that the least singular value should be at least be square root of the number of rows in the matrix. So that's square root of M. So if, if that condition is satisfied, A satisfies that condition, then if you do this, this simple attack, you have a X hat is going to be one minus little over one fraction away from X. Is, is this assuming uh, something about the error, right? Uh, yeah, so they're assuming the error is. Uh, uh, square root of n, or little of square root of n. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, that's. Um, so again, so as as I said, so so linear reconstruction could be done using either p equal to two. So either you look at put a two norm on the z minus ax or one norm, and they both lead to a different style of attack. So least squares or LP decoding. Uh, LP decoding attacks are stronger in that you can tolerate a much bigger error. So you can have a gamma fraction of entries to be arbitrarily large. And this was shown by uh, work of Doc, McSherry, and Talwar of how to analyze these attacks. And then, but uh, what you need is a stronger condition on A. And it's also costlier to run, because you, you are solving a linear program now. So for LP decoding, you need a stronger condition on A, but uh, it gives a stronger error bound. You can tolerate more noise. Yeah. Um, so with that, uh, let me describe our setting that we're going to uh, use. That we're going to describe to use to analyze conge contingency tables. Um, so we have a database D uh, with n rows and d plus one columns. Uh, the users are represented along the rows of the of the table, and the the columns are the attributes. Okay. Um, and what you're going to assume is that among these d plus one columns, the first d columns are uh, non-sensitive attributes. Okay, so 
when I say something is non-sensitive, I'm meaning that it's unknown to that adversary. So it's, those are kind of public information. And the, the last column, uh, we'll assume it to be sensitive information for the user. So that's uh, not known to the adversary. I mean, that's what the adversary is trying to infer from the release. So for example, it's known that uh, Alice smokes, but it's, we don't know whether she has high blood pressure. Um, so, so how do you launch a reconstruction attack if you have marginals? Um, so let's take the simplest case of uh, marginals, and that, that simplest marginal that you can think of is a two-way marginal. Uh, so basically what you're trying to do is you're trying to release uh, inner products between the columns of this, of this matrix. Okay? So two-way marginals, uh, say let's say you want to release a two-way marginal between A1 and X, that, that's just the inner product between A1 and X. Okay. Uh, so let's say that if you if you get release, if you release all these two-way marginals, so all the two-way marginals between x and the uh, columns of of uh, a1 to ad, so you get all these results. Okay. So now the attack is fairly simple. What you do is you just put your uh, a's in the you you know all your a's. You just stack them along the rows of the matrix. A1 transpose as the rows of the matrix. A1 transpose, a2 transpose, and ad transpose. So you're basically transposing the matrix and just multiplying them. So now a, this AX is the same as uh, these results. And notice that A is public information, because we, have, we assume that A1 to AD is known. That's, that's fairly simple, right? I mean, so you, you have this setup where you, uh, your A's is known, you, you, have, you get your noisy releases of Z, and you're trying to infer X. You put p equal to two or one, and solve for uh, either least squares method or LP decoding, and you get your x hat. Okay, that's that's very well understood. So now the same thing works for like if you're thinking of a three-way marginal. So what the, a nice way of writing a three-way marginal is like you see if you have three-way marginals between a1, a2, and x, you can think of them as being a um, atom add product between a1 and a2, and then inner product with x. So atom add product is just entry-wise product, so you're just multiplying the bits entry-wise. So if you do this, that's the three-way marginal between a1, a2, and x. Okay, so now, now a three, all the three-way, if you release all the three-way marginals, you are getting all these uh, entries. So a1, a2, x, a1, a3, x, and so on. So now, how do you construct a? You just do the same thing. You just put instead of a1 transpose, you put a1, a2, a1 atom add product a2 transpose, as, and these these are the rows of this matrix. So now, if you look at uh, the matrix a, uh, in this case, the matrix a was a, a d cross n matrix, right? Because there are, there are d columns. Now it's a d cross d square, or d choose to cross n matrix. So now we are increasing the size of the a. But you have more, uh, more releases. You still need all of them? Uh, yeah, you, you need a order of yeah, uh, d choose to. I mean, you need a d square. You don't need all of them, but you need a, yeah, you don't need all the d choose to, but you need an order of a theta of d square actually. Uh, and so, so that that's the attack. That's that's basically the entire reconstruction attack. So, and this this will generalize for higher marginals also. Instead of that, this thing something else will come up, but they all look the same. Um, so, how do you analyze these attacks? The the analysis is a little complicated, and that requires you to analyze the spectrum. Uh, so, okay, the first thing is that. We assume that uh, entries are IID now. So what you do is that we assume that all these AIs are going to be IID. Um, and so once you do that, things become much simpler. At least you can analyze. You think, start thinking about you start thinking about analyzing these attacks. Uh, and so and so let's say the one of the key lemmas is that if you have for, for this is for three-way marginals is that if if your AIs are all IID random vectors and some D satisfies some condition, then um, the the least singular value of this matrix is at least omega of d. Again, so what we needed was that the least singular value should be square root of this number of rows in this matrix. That's there are d choose two rows, and you get omega of d. Uh, the analysis is a little complicated because even though your AI, small AIs are IID vectors, you are adding correlations by taking these Hadamard product. So the, the, now the rows are all correlated. And the, the lemma extends to k plus 1 marginals also. Um, 
So you, now you have d choose k, number of rows, and your uh, least singular value of this matrix would be uh, at least uh, square root of d power k. And so, so this this is the final theorem. And uh, if you uh, use this uh, analysis, is that uh, if al algorithm releases all the k plus finite marginals with square root of d power k or square root of n noise, minimum of this, then you can then ad there exists an adversary which can re reconstruct x hat with uh, having distance between x hat and x being little of n. So the adversary can recover one minus little of n fraction of x. Um, so that's marginal tables, uh, and this was with L, just the uh, least squares attack. And in fact, you can get a stronger statement if, if you use instead of L two in an L one attack. So you use a linear program. Uh, and uh, maybe not, not that surprisingly, this uh, this could be also extended to any other Boolean function, not just conjunctions. Uh, and this this basically depends on the fact that. Boolean functions could be represented as a multilinear polynomial using standard Fourier decomposition. Uh, so, just a quick definition: uh, we look at Boolean functions on k variables, and we call it a new, new non-degenerate if it can be represented as a multilinear polynomial of degree exactly k. Okay, so every Boolean function of, with k variables could be represented as a multilinear polynomial of degree at most k, but where we focus on exactly k. And almost all the interesting Boolean functions that you can think of, except Huntas, fall under this, uh, and or XOR majority decision trees, and so on. Um, so, I mean, so what what does it mean by evaluating a Boolean function on this on this on this database? So remember what we are doing for three-way marginals was we are looking at a specific function, which is this uh, and function. So we are taking a when you're doing this, we are looking at the, just multiplying all the bits. Okay? But you can think of replacing this and function by any other function, any Boolean function. So you can now, for a general function f, you can say that instead of releasing this and function, I can, I'm going to release these. And I'm going to sum up all, for all the rows and release the final sum. So that's what uh, releasing a Boolean function on a table means. Uh, so now the adversary, instead of getting the distorted uh, entries like these, will get uh, now distorted functions. Which will depend on a small f. And again, it's not uh, too surprising because if you can do for conjunctions, it's probably true that you can do for all of the functions because it's, it's one of the conjunctions is one of the like uh, the prototypical function for Boolean variables. Um, and what we show is that that holds. Uh, you get the same kind of results. So the 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 noise that's needed is exactly identical as in the case of conjunctions. Or the marginals, and uh, yeah, this this was for uh, k equal to three, but the same thing works for more variables. Yeah, I'm going to. So these always depend on k, right? Yes. Uh, well, yeah. For a, for a general k, there will be a square root of d power k. So, uh, one thing I need to say is that uh, the, the analysis actually works for k equal to constant. I mean, we don't know how to do it for. K as a function of d, also, and that's because we don't know how to analyze the spectrum of random matrices when k is not constant. Um, so I'm going to, uh, like, in the last five minutes, I'm going to switch gears and talk about uh, how these linear reconstruction could be uh, used for get, obtaining lower bounds for releasing m estimators. And we have so we have seen a couple of talks on m estimators and. Uh, ERMs, and Pratik's talk was about ERMs. Um, so, so just a definition slide, uh, just to set the notation. Uh, so let's say we have n data points, uh, uh, x1 to xn. And let's, let's say we want to fit a parameter theta to these data points. So, And the way we are going to fit the, we see how good theta is to represent xi is using the sum loss function. Okay, so the loss function will define how good a fit theta is to xi. Um, so concretely, think of this as being a. Uh, say, if you want to solve, you can think of solving some uh, L2 square problem. So you have you have n points, and I want to find a theta which is which is going to minimize this L2 square distance. That's an ERM, or you can replace it by one norm. So in this case, you know, I mean, the standard thing is that this is the theta is the mean of these n points. In this case, the theta would be the median of n points. 
in general, you can define for any loss functions, and so you're trying to solve this problem. So you're, you have endpoints, and you're finding the data that is, that's going to minimize the sum of these loss functions. Um, and if the loss function is differentiable, the, the way to solve it is to take the gradient and, uh, and set it to zero. Uh, so I'm just going to say quickly about how things can be extended to logistic regression. So, uh, so logistic regression, in logistic regression, we are trying to fit, uh, you're looking at the logits of these, uh, of these independent variables, and you're expressing it as a linear function of independent variables. Um, so they hear the think of dependent variable as being the x and independent variables as being the columns of this a1 to ad. So, so the a logit, a logistic regression in a, the simplest way would be to say this, you look at these logit bits and you're saying that uh, and you're saying that, that's a, that expressing that as a linear computation of these columns of a, ais. Okay. Um, so here I'm going to take things for granted. It's getting late. Uh, so if if you do the maths, uh, the standard way would be to like I mean if you want to find theta, the the the, be, the best the way would be to take the maximum likelihood estimator of of these uh, of these functions and take the gradient of the maximum likelihood estimator and set it to zero. And if you do the maths, this is how it looks like. You can take this for granted. Uh, um, so you'll have some. So this is the function, this is the logistic regression between fitting AI and X together. So, you're, so you'll have dependence on AI, X, and theta hat is the logistic regression parameter. So as you see, I mean, the, the function may not look like linear, but I mean, it has some linear thing, but the, the in, enough things don't look like linear, but you're already starting looking some linear patterns that's coming up. And so, so what you do is just, so you have this, uh, so from AI, from for the first release, you can get this. Uh, a, a, the first release is like this. So you, if you have D such releases, what you start you do is you stack all of them together. Okay, so you just start putting them together. So this is you get these uh, a, this from the second release, A3 is things from the third release, and so on. And so now what you see is that if you look at uh, the the product of these two, it's independent of X. It's some constant because you know the AIs, so it's some constant B, and you have some matrix A, which is again the transpose of the non-sensitive information, and you times X. So suddenly, again, so it's again in linear form. So we have a linear system of the form AX plus B equal to zero. Uh, and there are slight technical issues here, is that you don't release, you don't actually get AX, you don't, you you are getting is what you're getting is the M estimators, so the estimators of theta hats and not the noisy version of this vector. But you need to do some work to show that the function, since the functions are Lipschitz, uh, you can overcome that, and, uh, and you get this result. So, so what, is, what is, it says is that, uh, again, uh, if you have uh, an algorithm that releases the parameters of logic segregation between the columns A1 to AD and X, and say, let's say D is at least 2N, I mean, it's, it's, uh, then you need to add 1 by square root of a noise to each parameter. And again, this is uh, fairly significant noise in this setting, because you're talking, thinking about a small number. Okay, and again, you, one can do a better attack using an L1 decoding. Um, uh, then the nice thing is that, uh, this thing actually works for any differentiable estimator. So if you have the function as, as long as the function as long as function differentiable, and the Lipschitz constant of the function of the gradient actually is small, this attack would work. Um, yeah. So 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 wrapping up. So what we show is that we can use linear reconstruction attack to prove privacy low bounds for a very like uh, natural uh, and very broad class of functions, which including Boolean functions, M, M estimators, um, and these bounds are actually tight for under this loose notion of privacy. I mean, a simple sampling argument would show that uh, you can you need at least square root of n. If you can you square root of n noises suffices for uh, upper bounds, because you can just sample n by two columns, n by two rows, and uh, work with them. 
information. Just so if I just, uh, so let's say I want to release uh, two way uh, conjunctions, uh, let's say in the products, I can just take, uh, I just sample half the rows of this matrix and throw out the remaining half the rows and just release my two way products, inner products on those, that part of the matrix. And it will be still with, if you, it will be still only square root of n away from the actual answer. Whereas we wanted to recover one minus it low one fraction of this. So in that case, you'll only recover at most half the entries. Um, so, so a couple of open questions that remain from this uh, line of work is uh, uh, these low bounds only seem to work, at least the, the analysis, and this is kind of a technical question is that it works only for differentiable M estimators, so we don't know how to do that for non-differentiable M estimators, so stuff like median, we don't know how to do it yet. Uh, but we know how, I mean, it's easy to extend these to, for example, if you have say a ridge regression or something. So if you have a regularization parameter in front of this uh, linear regression thing, it's still possible, but we don't know, as long as the function is differentiable. So we don't know if, if the function is not differentiable, the loss function is not differentiable, we don't know how to do it. And I think so, something more, uh, like something more philosophical is that we have, we have attacks, and I think all the attacks that we know are, are all of the linear form. So you get some y equal to x plus e, and you're trying to solve x at. Um, the, do nonlinear attacks help us in any way? Um, I don't know. Thank you. Yes. Maybe. Yeah, so maybe. one thing you can do is you can extract linear inequalities right. uh, by using the subgradients instead yeah. of the set of subgradients. But then you get some more subgradients. Uh, and the issue is that uh, depending on how big the set of subgradients, you get some some is, some some sub sub some more subgradients, and then it becomes right. So you, there's enough uncertainty in the subgradient that that might, there might be you know so there's that that creates some uncertainty. And the problem is if you if you can evolve with a smooth kernel or something, you're like you're changing the problem. That might not be the thing that you were given the minimizer but of. I can take it to limit, like the one we did in our. No, no, but here, like some. Well, okay, we can talk about it. I, basically, I, I'm not. I don't think, at least, n naively, it, it doesn't work. Straightforwardly, it doesn't work. But maybe, maybe this. More questions? Thank you.